Welcome to Film Forum Presents, a podcast featuring special live events recorded at our theater located at 209 West Houston Street in downtown Manhattan. In this episode, Film Forum Presents filmmakers Nan Fu Wang and Zha Ling Zhang, who appeared for a Q&A on the opening weekend of the acclaimed documentary One Child Nation on Saturday, August 10th, 2019. Their Sundance Grand Jury Prize winning film is a deeply personal reckoning with China's long held one child policy and its legacy. The Q&A was moderated by Vox film critic Alyssa Wilkinson. Please welcome our moderator for this evening, Alyssa Wilkinson, film critic for Vox, and directors of One Child Nation, An Fu Wang and Zhang Ling Zhang. Thank you all for being here to see this film, and um, thank you both for being here to talk about it afterwards. It's really exciting to see a full house. So I first saw the film back at Sundance in January, and it was uh, really quite moving and you know, very, it really stuck with, I think, everyone who saw it. And a lingering question that I had and that we've talked about a little bit is uh, the kind of risks that are associated with making a movie like this. How do you go into making a film like this? You've had some experience in the past with the Chinese government. So how did that work for both of you? For those of you who probably don't know, I made a film before that was really political sensitive. So after that film, I wasn't sure if I would be able to go back to China or not because the last day I was in China, I was interrogated by three national security agents and it was five hours of interrogation and I recorded them and put it in the film. So when when I was about to start, <laughs> uh, when I was about to start One Child Nation, there were several um, possibilities. One was they wouldn't allow me to go into the country. I could be stopped at the airport, or I could be stopped at the customs. Um, but what would it be worse? I thought would they allow me in? But as soon as I start filming the police would show up. And that way would not only jeopardize in the filmmaking, but also endanger whoever I would be filming. So it was then I reached out to Jalin. Uh, Jalin is a great friend whom uh, we met at um, NYU. We both went to NYU's uh, journalism school for documentary. And Jalin is a great filmmaker. And I, re I asked her, would you be willing to collaborate with me? And at the time, she was in China. And she said, yes which I'm still grateful. Yeah, so at that time, yeah, at the beginning, I made more travel to China and Nanfu stayed here. And then there's one Chinese New Year festival, uh, spring festival. Uh, she bring her baby and her husband to her hometown. And that was the first time you returned to China after Hurricane Sparrow. And, yeah. right, and then no one from the government showed up to question her. And that encouraged her to make more trips to China and film people, interview people from the village and the people in the film. And whenever she traveled to China, I stay in the US because we every time we want to reduce uh, attention and we always would keep the crew number to the minimum possible number and we make a lot of preparation f in every time before she travel because uh, until today we're not sure to what extent she's being monitored by the Chinese government so we always assume the highest um, level <laughs> for example like um, she would avoid checking into hotels and buying train tickets because in China you it's required that you have a national ID to uh, check hotel or buy a ticket. So th this will expose her to the authority because uh, the system might s uh, generate an alert if someone is high on the list of the government's watching list and then the local officials will get ready. So we avoid all these kinds of risks. And luckily, we finished the film. And like one lucky thing for us is that we edit a film here. And so we bring up footage from China, and then we edit it here. So we keep each trip in China very efficient. So were there moments where you were worried <laughs> that your footage was going to be confiscated or that you know you were going to be pursued in some way? Yeah, um, we often, when we go back to China, it's often times like at least uh, four or five um, copies of um, the hard drive. One copy with us, one copy with trustworthy person, and another copy. So you always like make sure that by the time you arrive in the U.S., there is still like something there in case anything 
going through the customs or anything happened. And there were a few times, um, one was um, right after the village chief um, interview where his wife um, said to me that you, sh you couldn't get it. That wasn't even the worst. Um, what happened after that was not in the film. The person, our neighbor, who took me to the former village chief, he was there at the interview, so he took he took a video of me um, questioning the former village chief and uploaded that video to the upper-level government. So as soon as I arrived home from that interview, I put down my tripod and I was about to put my camera away. Three guys showed up from the government and they questioned me like, what are you doing? Like, why are you filming? And I was very nervous and they said, you have to delete your footage. You can't. You can't do this. Uh, you can't talk about the one-child policy, and especially you can't show that village chief's house. Like the house was so poor. You can't show how poor China rural area is. You you are creating such a negative image of China. So I was very surprised that that's like he was. They were saying, and luckily because it was such a small place in the village, so they didn't use violence. And I kept a promise, I was like, okay, okay, I'm gonna delete it, I'm deleting it now, I'm deleting it now. And they um, just watched me, and it was the English menu on my camera, and <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was one time, and there was another time um, filming the trafficker on the train. That was the first time I decided to take a public transportation. Like Jalin said, when we went to film, in China, they could track you. As soon as you buy a ticket, you buy a flight ticket or train ticket or anything, the ID is registered in the system. So we always hired like private driver and stayed in that hotel. And that was the only time and the first time that I needed to be on a train because it was important for the story. And it was a 12-hour train ride, and I was planning to go as far as I can. But right after I got on the train, about like half an hour later, a police officer from the train station on the train came to me. They questioned, why are you here? What are you doing? What's your relationship with him? Where are you going? Show me your ID. And all of those things. And I answered a part of it truthfully. Another is like uh, just uh, try to get away with it. And then after a while, another police uh, uh, police officer showed up. So one after another, they kept asking me the same sets of questions. So I was I g got concerned that um, they would put my information in the system and then realize why I had made a film before. So it was then I decided as soon as the train arrives in the next station, I needed to get off and run as as far as quick as possible away from it before they realized or had an order to arrest. And Jalin did, she was in Massachusetts. It was like 12 hour time difference. And it was it was around like um, 1 a.m. In, in, uh, in China. And no matter what time, we were basically like a 24 hour working. And I just panically and contacted her and was like, oh my God, what do I do, what do I do? Yeah, <laughs> so she have a GPS tracker in her phone, and whenever she travels to China, I will watch her closely on a GPS tracker. And I know, like, I I know each hour where she should be, and then if she stay in a place for too long, then I will just become very uh, alerted. Like, so at that time she was in this train, uh, she jumped on the train station, and then, then I just have to figure out because she she can. It was midnight and there's yeah, no It was in the middle of go. nowhere. There was like complete darkness. Yeah. I didn't know which direction to <laughs> run to. Yeah, yeah. And then mm. it's crazy. And then we have a, and but we prepare for that. We hire a private driver, like he drive along the ra railway. And then just in the ca in case anything like that happened. And, but it happened sooner than we expected and the driver was not there yet. Like he was half an hour away or something. And then it was like, and she and she was on a motorcycle. She was not even sure that she was being followed. Yeah. Um, but fi she went to the bus station and went to the highway. Yeah, we we're trying to figure out like a safe point. And yeah. she would suggest uh, looking at a map. Yeah. Can you go to this highway and then we'll get the <laughs> 
driver to meet you. Like, can you stand like by this highway highway entrance? And I was like, no, I can't. It's 2 a.m. I can't stand at the highway entrance. Yeah, and then she's like, can you go to the uh, the city, but like find the local bus station? And I said, okay, I'm gonna go to the bus station. And no one's there. It, it was complete dark. It was a 24 hour bus. So anyway, so that was one night, and then we um I. Eventually, she su suggested a hotel. She found it's like big enough and it's open, and and so I went to the hotel, like pretend that I was going like a person who stayed there, mm -hmm. and waited in the lobby. And our plan was like, because we don't know if the police was tracking me, mm -hmm. and so the plan was leave the footage and hard drive in the hotel bathroom in the place. And if anything happened to me at that moment, mm -hmm. we can ha send somebody else to retrieve the footage the next day. Mm -hmm. So like that was, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this ended up being in the film like two minutes. This whole <laughs> yeah, <the> thing, <laughs> two <laughs> like two minutes seeing in the film. Two minutes, yeah. yeah. I think part of what's remarkable about the film too is you're not emphasizing the danger so much. Uh, you know, it's really about what it's about, but there's just all this stuff kind of going on behind it. I want to make sure we have time for audience questions, so I think we'll throw out to the audience now. Um, so we have time for a few, and they have a microphone, so don't talk unless you have a mic in your hand. Yes. I, uh, non I thought it was a, a really, to both of you, it was a really great movie. I, I, I really appreciated it. non is, is that your mother sitting behind me right now? Yes, yes, yes. So can you... <laughs> please, I, I I assume she doesn't speak English so yeah, well. Can no. you can you please ask her? Has she her mind changed even a little bit okay. after watching this so movie? Even just a small so part. I'm very curious. I, I about showed that. the finished film to her in January when we finished, and I subtitled the film for her because I wanted her to see. And then at that time, she said she still supported the policy. Now I'm curious. Is seven months later how she felt? Let me ask her. Ma, give me an answer. Now, you can see a picture of her. Her is like. She still supported it. Oh my God. <laughs> I have one more question for you. Yeah, I, I wanted I to ask why, but we are going to have a long conversation tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, it's sort of off topic, but you had a, a very good TED Talk that I saw where you Thank talked you. about propaganda, and yeah. you said that uh, propaganda in, in open view or is, is, is especially uh, pernicious. It's especially hard to see it. So you're kind of an outsider to America, so I was very curious. What what do you see in American society, American propaganda that that sort of just goes over my head and I would never notice? You would never notice. Oh, that's hard because I don't know you and I don't know how much you've already noticed. <laughs> um, I think um, like one thing that I if I I believe if you are already here tonight, you've noticed it, and then you are probably also don't need me to point out. Like the thing that I said in the film that really struck me was the limitation to reproductive rights and to reproductive health care in America. Um, as someone from China, when I first came and noticed that that was a certain state's policy um, in the U.S., I was shocked because it wasn't the America that I thought it would be. And I did not like know and it existed before. And since I, be since I came here in 2011, and it has gone so much worse. So I think that's something. Um, and one other thing, I think New York is, um, of course, like special place. And I've lived here for eight years. But the past few days, when I looked at the One Child Nation um, Facebook, account and our post there were like thousands of comments on it and when I read the comments I realized there was an America that I haven't really experienced or see yet haven't lived lived in New York for so long and but if you looked at the, all the comments I was shocked that these are the same people who are Americans and the thoughts the way that they think um, there were a lot of fights too, like both sides, but it's unbelievable. And I don't know if I have any solution or any uh, anything like, but I just hope if people see this film, maybe this could serve as a, as a reminder of when people, you know, um, don't question their surroundings, don't question the messages and what the consequences could be. I was actually adopted from China. I was born the same year and in the same province as that man did his photography. 
of the trash. Um, and my question was, how did you get like him and like the village chief and the midwives and everyone who participated in this film to participate, like knowing the consequences they could face? And my other question is, have, do you know if any of them have faced any consequences for participating? These people are like different. So the artist, um, he's been outspoken for a long time and he was one of the few um, people who were brave enough to do this. And um, we found him because he, before we even did any interview with him, he had accepted a lot of interviews from media, um, foreign media, exactly. And then we s we've seen like his work, pictures or something on, on the internet. And then when we reached out to him, it was very clear to us, like he was so, he, he's been doing that for a long time and he wanted to do the film because he also believed by speaking up um, that's the only way to make other people see the reality so it didn't take any convincing for us to um, film him and with the other people I think if you really like look at the film and everything they said and my mom included all of them supported the policy the midwife the official and everybody else except for the artist the journalist who, live, who lives in Hong Kong, the couple who lives in Utah, and the rest of the people all said the policy was positive. And even if the government look at the film now and to examine what they said, none of those were illegal or you know like exposed to any state secrets. Um, it was all a common thing everybody knows. And as far as we know, um, no one from the film has been contacted by the government yet. But you did say, or someone told me, that the film has been wiped off of the Chinese equivalent <laughs> of IMDb, <laughs> even though it won the grand jury prize at Sundance. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you yeah. so much for being also, here. Also, um, just I wanted to say one last thing. Um, as, a, as a foreign film, as an independent documentary, as a, you know, like a film about human rights, um, it's really hard to get like the wide audience in America, so we really appreciate you coming. And please, please tell your friends and family. The opening weekend is also very important for us to reach, um, to do well in the next few weeks, and hopefully get to more cities rather than just in New York and LA, which people already don't need to see this film. But we want to get to the places that they really needed to see this film. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Film Forum Presents. Special thanks to Amazon Studios for making this event possible. If you like what you just heard, please be sure to subscribe to get future episodes and rate and review so that more movie lovers can find us. Film Forum is an independent nonprofit cinema, and our doors have been kept open for nearly 50 years thanks to the invaluable support of our members and donors. Please visit www.filmforum.org for details on membership as well as information and showtimes for our current programming. See you at the movies.